having my baby. I'm a woman in love, and I love what it's doing to me. A sexy woman. Yeah, large-breasted, full-hipped woman who craves a spanking. Hello, everyone. Let's talk about the oblongs. I remember really enjoying this show a lot as a kid. I fondly remember watching my bulky 20-inch screen television in my bedroom on weekend nights to watch the edgy, more adult programming on Adult Swim. I distinctly remember in the very early 2000s lumping in the Oblongs, Mission Hill, and Baby Blues into their own category of my top favorite shows on the block, which makes sense considering they were all created for the ill-fated WB prior to being syndicated on Adult Swim. There's just something about the late 90s, early 2000s surreal humor that really exemplifies the turn of the century and how we present and digest humor. Before we get into the show, let's give a brief overview of how the Oblongs found its way from a failing late night animation block geared towards adults to a much more successful late night animation block geared towards adults. Today we're well into the 21st century. It's hard to believe that there are people in college that have been on Earth for a shorter amount of time than the contemporary Adult Swim has existed. Long gone are the days when Adult Swim was trying to find its identity. Prior to 2001, Adult Swim wasn't even called Adult Swim, but rather it was Cartoon Network stealthily airing their more teen, adult-centric shows such as C-Lab 2021, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, or Harvey Birdman with no announcement. This was done in an attempt to capitalize on the more adult-focused cartoons that were becoming popular during the 90s, such as The Simpsons or King of the Hill, which, hem, we all know where the latter eventually ended up. Then in September 2001, Adult Swim officially launched with the premiere of the original show, Home Movies, and soon Cowboy Bebop and Aqua Teen Hunger Force followed. Not long after its launch, Adult Swim began to designate Saturday nights for anime, which is where I was introduced to Yu Yu Hakusho for the first time, something I thank them for to this day. With momentum for the young block picking up, Adult Swim began to buy the syndication rights to shows that were prematurely canceled on their respective networks, namely the three aforementioned shows from the WB, but most importantly, Futurama and Family Guy. These shows brought about the numbers that turned some of the more obscure shows on the block into cult classics or even powerhouse cultural icons. So where does the Oblongs fit into all of this? Does it even fit at all? Perhaps not. And that's what makes it so special. This is truly a gem of a series. Out of the other WB shows I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I think this show has the best chance for a revival. I say that because the humor is more timeless. You could still largely tell the same jokes from this show today, and they would still hold up without additional context given the time period. A show with a setting like Mission Hill, where the dot-com bubble pop hadn't occurred yet, or Baby Blues that worked through the tribulations of child-rearing at the turn of the century, wouldn't land as well today. That's not to say they aren't very well-done shows in their own right, but many of their jokes make more sense based on the setting and time period. They exist within the time period in which they were created. Such shows would need a reboot with drastic updates to be relevant unless they're aiming for a period piece. But back to the Oblongs. This show was based off of the work of Angus Oblongs, Creepy Susie, and 13 other tragic tales for troubled children. The WB won the bidding war rights to the show and produced 13 episodes, only 8 of which aired on the network before being cancelled. The original intent of the show was to focus on Milo and the adventures of his other friends with their own deformities. The network looked into the potential and decided to make it about the family with the friends being side characters. This decision I think made the show much better since the emotional core being with the family has a bit more reach with audiences. Aside from the core family dynamic, there are also a lot of satirical takes on society ranging from classism, addiction, and how society views disabled people in general. Heck, in the first minute of the show, I mean the first 60 seconds, you already know exactly what the show's take is on the aforementioned subjects. Another 
glorious day to be alive. Rise and shine, Pickles, my love. You a cop? No. <laughs> and detox? No. And then it's all gravy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, she's cute. The setting itself is indicative of the situation our main characters are in. The world is split up into the hills, the wealthy literal upper strata, and the valley, the seedy underbelly where all the sewage goes. The family's father is Bob, who speaks like a 50s nuclear family type dad with silly catchphrases. Auga! and dated vernacular. I can't smoke this. I'd feel a fool. Despite having no arms and legs, he still makes a living for his family and has a relatively normal set of hobbies. He's voiced by Will Ferrell. Yes, Will Ferrell. I know it's hard to miss since his voice is so distinctive. The only way we ever achieve change is by doing absolutely nothing. But no one seems to mention his work on the show when speaking of his career. I understand that it's because it was a short-lived show that came out before his post-SNL career really took off, but I think he deserves more recognition, because I can't see him being voiced by anyone else. The mother, Pickles, used to be a resident of the Hills, but is now a chain-smoking alcoholic who lost all of her hair. <gasps> Oops, that's Mommy's juice. Despite this, she does not express any regret of leaving her easy lifestyle behind. She deeply loves her children and is still especially attracted to her husband to the point where they're still crazy hot for one another. Ah, Bob Long, you are sex. I'm gonna go upstairs and start plugging things in. She's voiced by Jean Smart, and the concept art of her character suggests that she was also meant to mimic the ideal 50s house mother in the same style as Bob. I'm glad they went with this version, though. The twin boys of the household are conjoined at the hip and have three legs. Biff is a driven athlete with latent homosexual tendencies, their words, not mine, while Chip has a more slacker attitude and consistently lusts after women, as most hetero teenage boys do. <laughs> Knock them down so we can check out their asses. They're voiced by actual twins and comedians, the Sklar Brothers. Milo, our main character, is possibly the least deformed of the family, aside from Pickles. Despite being heavily medicated, he has issues with concentrating at times and is still extremely hyperactive. Hey, sir, try some manic! It's the hot new energy drink, and when you're done, your wife can put flowers in the bottle. Oh, you're not married? That's a crime! Good-looking guy like you, so what do you say, Slick? You want a bottle? Think about it while I chew on your antenna! <laughs> okay, that second one he consumed an energy drink, but still! He is the most developed of the characters, with a sense of morality and idealism often present in young preteens, but also have moments of succumbing to the status pulls as well as naivety. Milo is voiced by Pamela Adlon, who really needs no introduction. But in case the name isn't ringing a bell, maybe this will help. That's my purse! I don't know you! Lastly, we have Beth, the youngest. She's a sweet little tattletale girl with a huge growth coming out of her head. While her character doesn't get much focus, she is a rare exception to the archetype character of a little child that's mostly there just to be annoying or to drive plot. She's a character in her own right whose dialogue suggests she's quite astute to her surroundings and the shortcomings of her family. Okay, joke's over. Where's my dolls, my jump rope, and my new watch? Little girls don't get presents when they act greedy. You forgot where you put it them, didn't you? She's also quite worldly. Yo, Beth, see you on the outside! Don't be no one's bitch! She's voiced by Jenny Elias. The rest of the characters include Bob's jerk boss, Mr. Clymer, and his bully sons, Anita Bidet, the bar owner, and James, the co-worker of Bob. They're all voiced by Billy West, and those are just the named characters. He has to be voicing like 80% of the non-named characters in the show. It's wild. Milo's friends include Helga Fugly, who's obsessed with the popular clique, the Debbies. Peggy, Mikey Butts, and Creepy Susie, who was the namesake of the original book series. What I like about this show is that it's not about a deformed family. It's about a family that has deformities. The plot centered around the family well, most, can easily be applied to other sitcoms with similar character archetypes with minimal tweaking. 
The characteristics do not define their personalities, rather their personalities exist outside the realm of their deformities, which makes for funny gags. Bob in particular enjoys his pipe, being around his kids, and has hobbies. His lack of arms and legs make for humorous sight gags, but they're not always the main focus, which is refreshing. Building humor around one thing would get stale quickly. But this show managed to balance out calling attention to the deformities as the punchline or just not overtly acknowledging it. Now, since I took that poll on my channel about which one season show I should do a retrospective on, I was wondering how I should tackle this. I could give an episode by episode review of the series, but I can't really do that without giving each episode its own ranking. And I have to be honest, there isn't really a bad episode in this show. Each episode is chock full of joke after joke, and they all pretty much land. While not being the most deeply written show, it does have a good balance of fun, optimistic humor, and outright nihilism. When rewatching this show, I realized how rich these plots are. The first episode, for example, has Milo lamenting that he can't go to a normal school given his severe inability to focus. Then we find out that Bob's job is about to cut him from his insurance policy due to numerous claims being filed as a result of their health problems brought about by their deformities or addictions. With this in mind, Milo schemes to get injured so he can go to public school with his friends. From here, you'd think, okay, the rest of the episode will be about him going through hoops to get hurt, and the episode will end with him finally making it to public school to kickstart the setting of the rest of the series. Nope, another injury happens right away, and Milo is in public school in the next scene. Allow me to explain the social hierarchy here at Hill Valley. There's the rich school kids from the hills, then come the jocks, then you've got your dorks, geeks, and dweebs, those wild dogs on the soccer field, the boy who lactates, and then there's us! Okay, so now you think the rest of the episode is going to be about Milo integrating into public school life. Nope, he immediately falls in love with a fellow student that is part of a high-ranking social clique and tries to pursue her. Sweet! Now, the rest of the episode will revolve around Milo trying to get her attention? Nope. With the help of his mom, he's able to score some alone time with her, which turns into her performing experiments on him because she's clearly an extraterrestrial. Well, certainly the episode will be about Milo and Yvette forming a bond. Wrong again. He's beaten up by the popular boys for being around the popular girl, and Helga schemes to get a love letter to her. The plan almost works, but is foiled by her own gargantuan appetite. When the popular boys find out about the letter, they rally to burn Milo and his friends' clubhouse down. The plan is foiled, and the kids feel triumphant. But the clubhouse is burned down anyway. I have a problem. Well, no matter, this means that Milo can be happy with his new girlfriend. Oh no, they thought of that too. Negative, not cost effective. Terminate self. Ah, oh, crap. Yvette! Oh, and that insurance being dropped thing? That skews off into a side plot where Bob tries to get part time work as a human cannon gets bullied by the bar patrons and the other contestants, and Bob being too cowardly to fight back due to the lack of insurance. This culminates in Bob mustering up the courage to fight back after seeing how down Milo is from his love troubles. Then the parents come together with Milo as he pokes at his first love's remains with a stick. Wow, that's a pretty complex plot for just 24 minutes. And that's not a special outlier. Almost all of the plots are generally like this. One of my favorite episodes, Pickles' as Little Amazons, starts with Pickles neglectfully putting Beth in mortal danger, but ends with her guiding a troop of Girl Scout knockoffs through the city with no resources after being abandoned by a bus driver. Oh, and Milo is dressed as one. Sir, I'm just a little boy in drag selling cookies. This show can go off in so many directions, and I love it. However, as well done as the show was, Angus Oblong voiced frustration that most of his intentions for the show did not make it into the final product. And even sadder still, Angus wasn't even informed of the show's cancellation by the network itself, but rather a fan emailing him of the news. But as he put it, he was mostly relieved, and I can understand why. In his own words, It was a constant uphill battle to get my ideas across. 
It ended up being a, a pretty good show. I'm not dissing the show, but it's not my show. He had a clear intent and vision of what he wanted to show, and the world was likely not ready for it yet. Or maybe his vision wasn't very palatable for most people. I mean, have you seen what Justin Roiland's work was before Dan Harmon reined him in for Adult Swim? Aside from the great jokes, there were a lot of visual sight gags that if you blink, they're easy to miss. That just shows how much humor they tried packing into this show, even with less than half an hour of runtime. Also, I don't know if this was intentional, given that it was the last episode, but this segment right here had some pretty smooth animation. Gong hai fat choy! What is wrong with you? I'm sorry. My desire to wear a hat and speak Chinese is getting in the way of my duties as a father. Just drive! Were they trying to use up the budget since it was the end of season one? Either way, this, like the other cancelled WB shows, really deserved better. I'm happy that it got a second wind by airing on Adult Swim, and now thanks to YouTube and the internet in general, the show can be easily accessed and viewed like never before. There have been whispers of a revival going around since the late 2000s. Who knows if it's going to happen or not. I think the style of humor that Adult Swim itself helped to cultivate with modern audiences can truly appreciate such a show again, and bring in the numbers to make it a success. But hey, if it doesn't happen, I'm glad we had it when we did. Personally, I don't think it's all that necessary. Media seems to be inundated with reboots, sequel series, and revivals that seem to either not be very good or divisive among the fan bases. I'd hate to see this show fall into that same trap, which would leave a bitter taste in our mouths if we rewatch the classic. But hey, that's just me. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Harvey McLeod, and I'm here to make videos for you. And I'll see y'all next time. Bye bye